Chapter 5 The next morning, as day was breaking, little Mike was awakened by the determined shove of a heavy homemade boot turning him over on the floor where he slept. He looked up along the baggy legs of black patched pants up along the faded blue hook and eye shirt to his father's bearded face canopied by the straight-brimmed black hat. A voice came down to him jestingly, If you sleep that good on the floor, maybe I should stop building beds for the colony. I sleep good anywhere, Michael Father. Michael grunted, Get up and help your mother. The bell has rung for milking. We're all late. Michael Newman strode from the room, expecting that he needed only speak to be obeyed. Ordinarily, little Mike would have jumped up, but for once he remained on the pallet, stretched himself, and locked his hands comfortably behind his head. Morning looked in through the small paned window and told him not to hurry. There should be a special morning after a special night. Take your time, little Mike. Interpreting the sound of a child's cry, the faraway cackle of the geese, the creak of a laundry cart, the voice of the cattle boss calling for helpers to round up the Angus gave him an idea of the time of day. It must be a little after 5.30. Milking was between 5.30 and 6. Breakfast followed whenever the milking was done, and the commune bell always sounded a five-minute warning. He heard Blacksmith Linder clear his throat loudly in the yard. Little Mike knew without rising that the blacksmith was washing himself at his house bench next door. He always cleared his throat that way every morning. Someone passed by close to the window, humming the marching tune of the great song, as though the melody still echoed in his heart. It sounded like the householder. He was very likely on his way to check with the truckman about the cattle load. When little Mike thought about this, he wondered why he did not jump up at once and hitch a truck ride out into the field. It would be an exciting ride over the bumpy road, and it would be a great sight to see the cattle rounded up and to hear the cattle boss call Moka. Jake Linder would be there. So would the other boys. Maybe the cattle boss would have to lasso the big steer. But just now, none of these things seemed important. The flush of light at the window told him that it was morning all over Joshua Volkner's world, and that the stranger still lay sleeping on the other side of the thin pine wall. He raised himself up. On the sturdy bed, baby Leia slept peacefully, tucked in between two pillows to keep her from rolling off. The bed against the other wall was empty. Anna and Mary had occupied it during the night, and he contemplated how comfortable it would be to enjoy the deep feather mattress for a while and wait for Joshua to stir. Instead, he got up and walked between the two beds and leaned for a moment on Rachel's wedding chest, looking out at the waking of another Hutarian day. The kitchen women were bestirring themselves, and smoke drifted lazily from the kitchen chimney. The geese were coming in, and the pet lamb was ambling through the yard, with the brown colony dog sniffing at it. There went the cattle boss, riding the big black horse bareback. There hurried the women with the red painted milk stools and the milk pails under their arms. Little Mike pressed his nose against the window. Everybody's late, 
everybody's late, cried the householder as he kicked a long-handled baby cart out of his way. Come, get a move on. He said this to no one in particular, but his tone assured little Mike that this was again an important day. The sun and the seasons never rest was the householder's motto, and the words seemed to wind up the commune every morning and set it into action, just as it was part of his task to wind up the official colony clock and keep that going too. Little Mike put on his black pants and unrolled the faded gray shirt he had used for a pillow. He brushed back his hair and went yawning into the outside room where his mother was working her customary magic. She stood over the wash basin set in its squat four-legged stand, washing Mary's face with a splashing motion. Ruth had just finished braiding Anna's hair and was tying the polka dot scarf under her chin. Mike, Sarah ordered the moment he appeared, quick to the kitchen and get some warm water. Here, use the knitting pail. Warm water, who's sick? Nobody's sick. I want it for Joshua Volkner to wash with, to shave with, hurry and go. Thoughts of Mr. DeMoss sent him with business-like steps into the commune yard. Was it winter that a man needed warm water? Was Volkner so special that everything in the colony had to be changed for him? Why could he not wash the way the men and boys were busily washing themselves with rapid splashes on the house benches? It did not take anyone long to wash in the morning because no one was dirty so early in the day. Just a splash and then a quick dry on the long flour sack towels that hung ready at hand. Warm water to shave with, the noisy geese stirred up the dust and shuttled their chattering bills into the dirt made moist by the discarded wash water. They hung around the rain barrels at every colony door and came in ever-increasing numbers until they filled the spaces between the chalk-block homes. Little Mike walked through the midst of them, swinging the small tin pail. Morning Mike called little Dan Mueller, drying his hands on one end of a towel while his father dried his at the other. Wait, I'll come along wherever you're going. Jake Linder waved to him. Paul Weiss had found a piece of rope and was snapping it like a whip. Out of somewhere came the voice of Paul's father. Stop that, Paul, or you'll put out somebody's eyes. Joey Cunns, pulling a baby brother, in a long-tongued wagon said, Did you run out of wash water, Mike? Going to the Missouri for some. It's worse than that, said little Mike, and continued on his way. Michael Newman came busily out of the cabinet shop, heading with his toolbox in the direction of the mill. When he spied little Mike, he stopped long enough to ask, where with the pail to get warm shaving water for Joshua Faulkner? Shaving water, Michael sputtered. Tell him we've seen men with beards before. The cattle boss galloped through the yard on the big black horse. Children ran after him yelling excitedly. Don't go in the field before breakfast, children, cried the rider over his shoulder. Later, some of you can go on the truck. Hey, Carpenter Michael, called the town man. Is the worldling up? Is he going today for sure? Ask me something easy, Michael rejoined. You know how visitors are. They say they are going, and then they stay. If they like the outside so much, I should think they would want to leave even before breakfast. For me, said Thomas Mosner, 
I get my fill of the world just with my weekly trips to Yankton. Get the elders to appoint a new town man if you don't like the assignment. Oh, it's all right, the town man hastened to say. It's all right, I only meant you know. The milk boss hurried to the cow yard, lugging two tall cans. Everybody's late, he complained. Even the cows are getting impatient. Little Mike pulled open the screen door. Fleshy, good-natured Mary Cunns, the kitchen boss, stood over the huge iron range, and her cheeks were red as paint. She had pulled her blue polka dot head scarf over her face for protection, but it was not enough to save her from the heat as she stirred the gruel in the large iron kettle. Warm water, if you please, said Mike. Warm water, what kind of game are you boys playing already today? For Mr. Volkner, he told her to shave with. She gave a little cry. He keeps everyone up until past midnight. Now he wants to be served first thing before breakfast. This staying up was not his doing, Mike had to say. The great song took the time. Mary Cunns shook the steam and water from her hands and wiped them on her apron. And when Newman Michael leads, every single verse and every line must be sung. In our household, the men folks didn't come home until who knows when. How late was it? How late? Do we have watches and clocks all of a sudden? Joshua Volkner has a gold watch and a gold watch chain, too. He even has a wrist watch. Mary Cunns cried. It all depends on what suit he wears, I hear. He is even supposed to have three suits right in his automobile. But he can wear only one at a time, no matter how many he owns. She chuckled at this until her body shook, took the pail and began removing the lids from a number of kettles sticking in her finger to find the water that would be just right. Filling the pail, she observed, Joshua Volkner will have to shave fast if he wants breakfast with the rest of us, or does he want it served him in his room? She laughed loudly, and you, she observed, stirring the gruel with the long wooden spoon, I suppose today you boys will want to build the big wheel. What big wheel? Like Joshua Volkner told our Joey, the spoon turned faster, a big wheel that carries people, filling his head with such ideas. If you boys want to build things, build me a bigger woodpile. The wheel with people stuck in little Mike's mind. They thought that Joey Cunns was in possession of such <clears throat> startling information was momentous. He withheld his eagerness for more information and went out quickly. Catching sight of Joey, he called, Come here to me, I'm in a rush. Joey came with the end of the long tongue of a baby wagon, sticking out from between his legs, a piece of wood clamped in his mouth like a horse's bit, and his bare feet imitating a gallop. His shirt was made of a print material like the remnant of an apron hastily utilized, and over his black hair he wore a small dusty short visored cap from beneath which sparkled mischievous black eyes. Arriving at Mike's side, he slowed down to fall in with him. The baby, ten feet back in the cramped box-like wagon, its tiny white cap tilted down over its face, bounced up and down on a gunny sack as the uneven wheels of the wagon wobbled crazily on their broom handle axle. Joey said, Is it Missouri water you got, Mike? Warm water from your mother in the kitchen for Joshua Volkner to shave with. Joey took the bit from his mouth and threw it away. That I'd like to see. What? Shaving. 
over the face with a sharp knife. We, I've never seen anybody shave either, Mike said. Joey seemed to dance a little jig while the wagon and the baby bounced. Where does he do it, he asked. Mike gave him a guarded glance and spoke in a whisper. You could see it, Joey, through the window if nobody sees you. Which window? My room window where I usually sleep with my sisters. Only I didn't last night because Joshua Volkner had the whole room to himself. Your room window is not too high, Joey assured himself. No, it's low. Joey said, I should maybe get Dan Mueller. He'd be glad to see that too. So would Jake Linder. Jake, we should have. Too many make a scene. Joey figured deeply. Mike nodded. Too many do. But a person doesn't get so much enjoyment if he is alone. How about you? I, Mike said, stopping dead in his tracks. All beyond the inside, come to think of it. His hand tightened on the water pail. But what if the breakfast bell comes too soon? To see shaving, I would miss breakfast any time. I too, Joey. Look, there goes Sarah Mother to the milking. It will give us time enough. How long does it take? You know how long it takes to milk as well as I do. I mean to shave. Who knows that? Mike watched his mother hurry to the cow yard, her black apron and long black dress swinging with her rapid stride. Under her left arm, she carried her red milk stool. On her right swung the milk pail. Wait, Amelia Mueller, I'll walk with you, she was calling. Joey pricked up his ears. I can get Dan easy now, he said. There goes his mother and your mother together, and there Dan stands, letting the gander snap at a stick. Hey there, Dan. The baby I'll turn over to my sister. Baby care is a girl's work anyhow. Thank you, Mike, for the invitation. Joey. Yes, Mike. Joey, what about the big wheel? Joey's black eyes grew large and he locked his legs together to hold the wagon handle in a manner that afforded him the use of both hands for description. It's a wheel that Joshua Volkner showed us in a picture. In it, his boy was riding. A Ferris wheel, he called it, five stories high. That is two and a half times higher than Mueller Daniel's house, or twice as high as the mill. I figure the wheel goes around and it carries people, even at night, because it has lights on it, and the lights go around with it, too. Mike turned his eyes to the Mueller home and caught his breath. Two and a half times. That would be higher than the highest tree. And trees don't turn, Joey hastened. You can sit on a tree and you just sit. You can turn and look in different directions all right. But think of going up and down and around all at once. From so high a person could see across the boundaries of the commune. From so high a person could look right out into the world. In the daytime he could see all over the world from such a height. And at night Joey, think how close you would be to the stars and to God's lantern. Rachel stood in the doorway. Mike, come with that water and hurry up. It's only Rachel, Mike figured. It's not Michael, father. I'll get Dan Mueller, Joey whispered, for two to watch a great thing like jo Joshua Volkner shaving will be more enjoyment than for one alone. Also, it is easier to be scalded together with someone if we should be caught. Rachel was angry that women had no more say in the commune than they had. 
get into your room, she scolded. Mr. Volkner has already asked twice where the hot water was. Mike started to push open his bedroom door. Then he bethought himself and rapped. Come in, come in, came the welcoming voice. Since when do we rap in the commune? Joshua Volkner stood with one foot on the closed chest, running a soft wool cloth over his already shiny brown shoe. Then he folded the cloth and put it neatly into his suitcase. Good morning, Mike, he said cordially. Your mother said you were bringing this. He took the pail and stuck in a finger. Hmm, it's not too warm. Now, if they would just pipe this in here from the kitchen instead of depending on boys' legs. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Mike took note of the open window, judged, judged its distance satisfactorily, but saw with concern that there were more people in the yard than he had bargained for. There was Jake's mother pushing a heavily loaded laundry cart, making the tall iron wheel squeak dryly on the uneven ground. There was James the teacher walking with an open book, using the early morning hour for his memory work. Almost in front of the window was Paul Weiss's older sister carefully braiding her younger sister's hair. The bee boss sat on a house bench, fixing a smoke box. Children wandered in the yard. A pink-capped little girl embraced the pet lamb. Little boys picked up the geese, held them a moment against their bodies, then let them go. Young girls carried their baby brothers. Older girls collected the long towels and began scrubbing up the house benches. Joshua looked out too and said with a sigh, Yes, I had almost forgotten mornings in the commune. The three-legged milk stools painted red now. I see a touch of the world, the procession of the polka dot head coverings. Forty milkers trudging to the cow yard every morning and every night. The crisp smell of autumn, the scent of wood smoke from the kitchen. Listen, the colony truck. That's a sound that wasn't heard twenty years ago. And I noticed that your mother put a mirror here on the wall for me. Twenty years ago, mirrors were verbotum. The world, then he said again reflectively, the world, it was awkward being alone with Mr. DeMoss. The man looked different from the way he had last night when he sat under the withering words of Pastor Kunz. Last night, the men had formed a strong wall behind which little Mike could sit securely. Now there was nothing to protect him but his own knowledge, nothing to fortify him but his own hatred of the world. Even the room did not seem familiar. Joshua had taken it over. His brown leather suitcase was on the bed. The pillows were tossed one on the other, and the blanket was thrown back so that the soft, deep feather mattress seemed to be up for inspection. On the sleeping bench, in orderly fashion beside the oil lamp, stood a bottle, a brush, a small leather case, and also the gold watch and chain, and a leather strap, everything in as neat a line as articles on the commune kitchen shelf. Joshua poured some of the warm water into a basin. I want to thank you for the use of your room, Mike. It's not my room, it's the colonies. Yes, of course, excuse me. My sisters sleep in the bed. I sleep on the sleeping bench. That's the sleeping bench where your things are. It's a bench, but it opens for sleeping. Michael Father made it. 
He made nearly all the furniture in the colony. He made the big bed, too. I remember that you said last night you wanted to be colony carpenter some day. Yes, some day you'll be a cabinet maker if you follow the tradition. Carpenter Michael, they'll call you. Little Mike wanted to say that he had already helped his father many times, but the quick thrust of a head wearing a dusty gray visored cap arrested him. Joey Cunz was springing up and down at the window like a young colt. Joshua was busy taking things from a little leather case. Mike made an excited motion to Joey to stay down out of sight, but instead Dan Mueller's red face shot up, then Jake Linder's, so high and daring that Mike could see the fleshy growth on Jake's neck. Joey Cunz appeared again, and then up came little Mike's cousin, Matt Newman, with ears that stuck almost straight out. Up and down bobbed the heads, four pairs of eyes leveled for a moment over the window sill, alert and furative as mice in the granary. They disappeared in one motion as Joshua turned to dip the brush into the water. He worked the brush around a few times on a sweet-smelling stick of soap. Up came the eyes every time Joshua's back was turned. Down they went whenever he swung round to the window. Now the brush was growing thick and white with foam. By the way, little Mike, how did you like the great song? Joshua asked. I still hear it. I wouldn't have missed it for all the world, Joshua, Joshua agreed. Do you like music? Singing, I like, Mike told him. Music we don't believe in. Yes, yes, of course, Joshua assented. He stepped to the mirror and painted his cheeks with the brush, then his chin and his neck, until he had a beard whiter than Pastor Cunn's. The faces at the window crept up and stared open-mouthed. Paul Weiss, whose freckles covered his face and forehead and ears, had joined the group and wrestled to make a place for himself at the crowded sill. The five boys clung there now, cheek to cheek, in a solid row. I thought you must surely like music, Joshua said, through his soap beard. Your father is a good singer. He knows more than a hundred tunes, Mike replied, hoping to draw Joshua's attention over to where he stood, near the closed chest. He knows many hundred songs. Yes, Michael Newman was always good at mem memorizing. Joshua now whipped open his shining razor. It came out of its black case like a silver fish out of a dark pool. It was long and cold looking and had an edge thinner and sharper than any tool in the carpenter shop. Carefully, he touched it to his cheek and drew it down almost to his chin. Mike held his breath. He could almost feel the sensation, and the fragrant smell in the room was of a kind never found in the hard, brown chunks of soap which the colony made in its iron kettles. The smell and the sight of the shaving almost transported him away, but the heads at the window were craning over the sill and into the room. Joey Cunz forgot where he was, hanging wide-eyed over the recessed window ledge. He gasped aloud. One slip, and the blood will squirt. Joshua turned and caught sight of his audience before they could withdraw from their perch. Come on in, boys, come in, he invited good-naturedly. But just then a powerful voice rose over the commune yard. Boys, away from there, back where you belong. The faces dropped from the window like apples when the garden boss shook the tree. Little Mike felt the words. 
strike the chalk blocks with a thud. The yard lay stunned in silence, but Joshua went in amusement to the window. Pastor Cunn stood on the board sidewalk in front of the home of Titus Weiss, and he looked like Moses come down from the mountains. The boys were running riotously through the yard, scattering the geese and stirring up the dust. Pastor Kunz shook his fist in their direction, black hat squarely on his head, his spectacles mirroring flashes of sunlight, his beard bristling. Joshua called in a friendly tone, Good morning, Pastor Kunz. The pastor squinted at him distastefully as the worldling leaned half-shaven over the sill. So that is the attraction, Pastor Kunz exclaimed. An early morning show for the children, is it? Beware, Joshua Volkner, beware. Then he wheeled about and with firm steps walked haughtily away. Joshua laughed and turned away from the window while little Mike was filled with wonder and awe at the fearless ways of the man, for Mr. DeMoss went to the mirror and continued drawing the sharp knife back and forth over his smooth skin. What was the secret, something that made him so sure of himself? Why did he not tremble at the pastor's wrath? Why did nothing seem to bother him? He did what he liked. He dressed the way he wanted to. He had no one to tell him that he had to be like other men. There were no boundaries that he could not cross. There were no forbidden things that he could not do. Greatly disturbed, little Mike started from the room. Volkner's voice was gentle. Wait, little Mike, there's something I want to show you. Wiping his face with the towel, he went over to his suitcase and took from it a small wooden box, no larger than Mike's hand, a box with gold and red pictures on it, pictures of a boy playing on a musical pipe in a meadow where sheep were grazing. Joshua pressed the box and the top sprang open. Inside was something that gleamed brighter than the morning sunlight. It's a harmonica, Joshua explained. He took the sparkling instrument from its soft, velvet-lined case and handed it to little Mike. It was cool to his hand. It was the brightest and loveliest thing he had ever seen. The edge, which had tiny air compartments, was white as the whitest chalk block. That's ivory set in ebony, Joshua said, and the top does look like silver, doesn't it? It's from a store in Chicago. Mike could not speak, helpless and conquered. He feasted his eyes on the harmonica. I'll show you how it works, said Joshua. My boy Robert has one, and he knows a number of songs. It's not difficult. He put the harmonica to his lips and drew soft music from the instrument. Gentler than the sheep bells, it sounded, high and low tones, short and sharp as voices, then slow, beckoning melodies that whispered just for the room and not for the commune yard at all. Almost as good as singing music, Joshua assured him. So, little Mike, the harmonica is yours, all yours. He pressed it into Mike's hand and hurriedly proceeded to finish dressing. Mike wanted to say, I can't take it. We have nothing like this in the commune. I'll have to give it to the householder, for it's a personal possession. He will sell it or do something with it, for if I have one and the other boys don't, that would not be right. Thank you very much for the offer, Joshua Volkner, but you know how it would be. He said nothing, something he had never felt stirred his heart. His fingers caressed the cool silver surface. His admiring gaze 
devoured the box and explored the texture of the lining. When he touched the inside of the box, it was as soft as down, and the color was pink as the sunset sky. Tenderly looking at the harmonica, he addressed it in a faraway voice. I could put music into you, too. Of course you can, Faulkner agreed. You'll have a great time with it. It will be our secret. Little Mike looked up with frightened eyes. He could not explain his feeling, but it caused his hand to tighten on the instrument. For the first time, someone had given him something for his very own. So, Little Mike, the harmonica is yours, all yours. He put the instrument into its box. He would tell Joshua Volkner he was sorry, but that it was not for him. He would be glad all his life that he gave it back. It was not right that he should keep it. He felt it was not right, and he snapped the box shut. The sound was like the closing of the big Bible. It was final. He had made up his mind. Volkner, standing at the mirror, was tying a red tie and pulling it tightly against the collar of his white shirt. He was speaking in his casual way. I sometimes think that if a person could play the harmonica real well, it would be like the music of the big wheel. I was telling the Kunzes about that, the Ferris wheel that Robert and I often ride, in the amusement park. It carries people in seats, seats with a bar across so that people can't get out at all until they are let out by the Ferris wheel boss. Around and around they go. They never really get anywhere, but there they go just the same, round and round and round, and it's great fun. And all the time there's music, there's music just as if someone is playing a big harmonica. Everybody hears it, and it makes the riders happy. Even those who are afraid, when they're up where the wheel is highest, they hear the music, and they say, everything will be all right. There was a sound outside that sent fear through little Mike's body. He had heard the breakfast bell all his life but it had never sounded so near, so loud, so accusing. It had never struck at him as it did now. He always sped out of the house and raced Jack Linder and Paul Weiss and Joey Kunz to the community kitchen when the bell rang. Now it was like a hammer pounding. It nailed him to his spot as tightly as if Michael Father had driven him down with one of the long spikes. Breakfast, exclaimed Joshua, glancing out of the window. Yes, there are the women returning from the milking. There comes the milk boss from the separator shed with the big cans. James the teacher puts his book away. Everything on schedule. No time wasted. Everything according to the day's plan. Ah, Hutarians. Hutarians, stubbornly holding to a system that can't survive. He put on his coat and took a wristwatch from his suitcase. This he slipped quickly over his hand and fastened it. There was a rap at the door. Joshua Volkner came Sarah's voice. Breakfast. I'm coming, Sarah Newman. All go on ahead, came the quick reply, and Mike heard the outside screen door slam. Yes, yes, of course, said Joshua with a sigh. It wouldn't be right for us to walk together, Sarah. It wouldn't be right for us to go laughing and free across the commune yard. No, you must hurry, and I must hurry. The bell has rung. I see the men going, swinging their arms. They do not hold open the screen door for you. No, they let it slam. They will sit at one table and the women at another, and it will not be right to come in after the breakfast prayer. Traditions are starting another Hutarian day. <clears throat> day. He turned to go. 
Well, come along, Little Mike. He went out, leaving the door open, expecting Little Mike to follow. Mike stood alone in the center of the world, his hand moist over the precious gift. All yours, all yours, something kept saying. Joey Cunz galloped past the window and looked in. Hey, Mike, he shouted. Better come. It's your morning to pray. Mike clung desperately to the box as he walked into the outside room. There, in a final, final moment of confusion, he slipped the harmonica into his pants pocket, flung open the screen door, and ran from the house with all his might ran as if he were running from Pastor Cunz, from the seven stern and bearded elders of the old Portage Colony, and from Jacob Hutter himself, though he knew that Jacob Hutter had died in Innsbruck more than 400 years ago. Chapter 6 Little Mike lay on his back on the sheep hill while the musical clank of the bells could be heard on the white sheep counters. He raised a hand from the cool grass, then he lifted his head to spy out his surroundings and to assure himself that he was all alone. Cautiously, he touched the harmonica to his lips. The sounds he drew softly and guardedly from the instrument, nestled in the clumps of grass on which he pillowed his head. He had learned to play notes that sounded like the bells themselves, but best of all was the enchantment of having learned to play one line of the melody of the great song. He played that over and over. He played it to the morning sky and to the graying clouds. He played it to the sheep and to the river running soundlessly below the hill. Come, brothers, and let us sing of the true faith. For three days the harmonica had burned in his pocket, and every night he had guarded it under his pillow. For three days he had tried to be alone as much as possible, so that he could learn to play. Even Joey's talk about building the great wheel held only minor interest, but sometimes he was afraid. Would he ever forget that first <clears throat> morning and how he sat with the boys at the long breakfast table in the children's refectory? He had felt like a stranger, a worldling himself, as he took his place on the backless bench. The touch of the harmonica in his pocket kept enticing him away from his surroundings. When he prayed at the table, his hands, still trembling from holding the instrument, were pressed palms together, and he wondered if God would punish him right there during the prayer or wait a while. Falteringly, he recited, Thank you, Father, for these thy gifts. And when those words came out uneventfully, he hurried through the rest, which we have received from thy bounty. Amen. He was through. That much was over. Paul Weiss had nudged him and whispered, you sure slid down the hill fast once you got started, but that's all right. I'm hungry. Little Mike had no appetite. The harmonica lay <clears throat> in his pocket like a heavy weight. He wanted only to get away and examine it all over again, maybe blow on it just once more, and then return it to Joshua Volkner. But after breakfast, everything happened at once. The colony truck roared into the field with happy, shouting children clinging to it and inviting him to come along. His father ordered him to get the measurement of the schoolhouse windows so that he might cut the curtains 
sticks. Then Joshua Volkner began taking his suitcases to the automobile, and there the important talk with the householder and Michael Father took place. Volkner said, Well, I'd like to pay for my room and board, gentlemen. All you have to do is try it, snapped Michael. Then we'll know you have laid aside every bit of Hutterian belief for good and all. On the contrary, Volkner answered, I remember one of the cardinal tenets is that no sojourner in a commune shall ever be permitted to pay for his keep. How does it go? Here, little Mike, you tell me. Surely it's still part of the training. When Joshua said that, little Mike came to attention and recited, If any man is absent from his home and lodges with us, let him be taken in and entertained, served and hospitably treated, according to our ability, but never for money, ever free and without cost. This we do because the saints of old did likewise. Yes, that's exactly right, Volkner affirmed. Not a word has been changed. Thank you, little Mike, for refreshing my memory. It wouldn't be honest for us to say that we are glad you came or that we are sorry to see you go, observed the householder gravely. We elders regret that the world has corrupted your thinking and warped your life. That you cannot think clearly is easily seen and that your sense of what is good and useful in life is all confused goes without saying. But as for taking money or anything from you, thank you no. Keep your worldly goods in private, and we will keep God's things cooperatively as he has ordered. The reason I'd like to pay, Joshua said, is because I should like to come back. Didn't I tell you, cried Michael, I told you when you came that you were unhappy in the world. Why else? Did you come but for homesickness? The world is wide, but there is no room in it. No, no, Joshua corrected. <clears throat> I only meant that I'd like to come back for your Rachel's wedding and perhaps bring Miss Volkner and the children with me. Stop making out that we're a theater, Michael warned. So say I, said the householder, you've been here now, and the thing is done. I know how Pastor Kunz would feel if you started to bring the family. Then Volkner surprised them by saying that he would go to the pastor and ask him just how he would feel about it. With that, he marched straight off to the home of Pastor Kunz. After a while, he returned <clears throat> to say that the answer of the boss of bosses could be summed up in a proverb. The poor man has God in his heart. The rich man has him in his purse. Then Joshua came for the last time to his car, carrying his coat on his arm and his hat in his hand. Only six of the men found time to gather at the car and say farewell to him. The others had said their offhand goodbyes when they saw him at breakfast. No one asked him to return. None asked him to extend his stay. Michael Newman shook hands with him hastily, then thrust both hands deep into his pants pockets. Volkner came to where little Mike stood with Jake Linder. Mike's heart stood still for fear the man would say something about the harmonica, but Joshua only said, Goodbye, little Mike, and good luck. If I come for the wedding, you'll meet my Robert. He's just your age. The only woman at the leave-taking was Sarah Newman. She happened to be pulling a laundry cart through the yard at the moment. 
Volkner raised his hat to her and called, Off Wierderspun. Her steps quickened, and she was soon out of sight behind one of the houses. Then he took his place behind the wheel. The town man stood on the running board and rode along to the boundary where he opened the gate. Then the big black car passed through. The men remained standing almost as they were when the car first started. They seemed to be listening and wondering while the sound of the motor grew fainter and fainter and finally faded into the unmeasured acres of the outside world. Michael broke the silence. Well, gentlemen, Mr. DeMoss must work out his own salvation. When a man thinks he is too good for the commune, it shows that he is bad enough for the world. Poor Joshua Volkner. He drove away before he had a chance to see the cattle truck come rolling out of the meadow with the big steer and the other cattle safely behind the wood bars. That was a sight. The pastor came out to see it, and the elders examined the sagging springs of the truck, and the householder sucked at a straw, already seeming to judge the weight and the cattle receipts. Michael Father tested the truck bars to make sure they would keep the stock captive on the long trip to Omaha. The women quit work long enough to come near and admire the sleek black coats of the Angus. Then the cattle boss climbed into the seat next to the truckman and off they started, with the children running and shouting alongside all the way to the commune gate. There went the big steer, proud and stubborn, even though he was caught. Defiantly he raised his wonderful strong head and showed off his muscular neck. No more would he hear the call, Moka, Moka, Goodbye, big fellow, goodbye. Out into the world you must go, out into the world to be killed. <clears throat> The sound of the truck had faded away even as had the sound of Joshua Volkner's automobile, and the commune returned to its routine. Come, brothers, and let us sing of the true faith. Let us tell you of our history, how we were driven from Germany. Here on the Sheep Hill, the harmonica seemed to add new lines by itself. Mike pressed both hands over it tremblingly and huddled as closely in the grass as he could. The harmonica was a thing alive, and warmly its musical heart was throbbing. The taste of the ivory and ebony was sweet as honey. The feel of it was magical. Little Mike whispered affectionately, I love you so very much, Harmonica. He thought of the words in the song that spoke about the hard and barren heath, and he thanked the cloudy heavens for the soft ground on which he lay. No one to harm him here, no one to demand martyrdom of him, no one to say that his people should move on. This was America. He needed only to move his lips over the harmonica, and he was marching at the head of all the American communes. He was Colony Carpenter. He was riding in the big wheel. He was with Joshua Volkner, traveling all over the country. He was on the Sheep Hill, satisfied, happy, wanting nothing. He played the harmonica, low and subdued, seeking out the notes of the great song. He lay with eyes closed, transporting himself wherever he wished. A sound intruded that was not the soft, roving sound of the sheep. It was a grating noise, 
and the crackle of grass. Frightened, he opened his eyes, standing close by. Looking down at him were Jake Linder and Paul Weiss. Then along came Joey Cunz, pulling a banged-up tin bucket on a long, crooked stick. Mike quickly stuffed the harmonica into the grass under his body. What do you want? What are you doing here? Paul asked. What have you got? Where did you get it? It makes music, Joey said. Paul's freckled face was livid with excitement. We heard it even down the hill. It sounded like the great song, Jake suggested, only without the words. Mike said, It's nothing. That is lying, Mike Newman. Paul accused him. We know we heard something. It's like a willow whistle, Mike told them. We dare not make willow whistles, Joey reminded him. Then he asked hopefully, Or did you make one anyway? Show it to us, Mike. Jake urged, we won't tell. Mike looked at Jake earnestly. If there was such a thing as a best friend in the commune, Jake Linder was that one. But Jake was really no different from Joey Cunz. Mike could trust them both, and it was Paul Weiss who gave up his chance to come to the Sheep Hill today, and never even asked why Mike was so anxious to come. Three friends were here, Mike told himself, and he ought by rights to tell them all about the harmonica, especially since they almost knew already. Paul Weiss kicked the grass impatiently. Keep your willow whistle. All I'm looking for is Paul Father. Is he here? Mike shook his head. Oh, I know he isn't right here, Paul argued or you wouldn't be playing music. Paul Father is an elder. As he said, this he gave Mike a glance of special warning. It was enough to cause Mike's hand to seek for the harmonica and cover it. He sat up. All right, he said. I'll tell you what it is. I'll even show you. We won't tell, promised Joey, excitedly tossing aside his long stick and flopping down beside Mike. Jake and Paul sat down, too, plucking expectantly at the grass, which Mike wondered was the greater sin, to hold a secret or to possess something for oneself alone. If I show the harmonica to them, he thought, it will be like sharing it. Sharing is what we are supposed to do. James the teacher taught us that. He who has a coat will give it to his brother, who is naked. Sharing is like giving. Aloud, he said, it's this, and held out the harmonica in his open hand for all to see. Quick as a goose stabbing at a chunk of bread, Paul Weiss snatched the instrument. What is it? he cried. Not something to be rough with, Mike exclaimed, resting it from Paul's hand. You fight about it. Paul accused him in a tone that was already reporting Mike's action to his father. That's what comes of personal possession. No, it's not, Paul, said Mike in an odd voice. I only mean that this is something to be careful with. It makes music only if you're kind to it. How does it play? asked Jake gently. He's stingy with it, Paul accused. Where did you get it? Joey wanted to know. I got it from Joshua Walkner, Mike began. Him, Paul shouted. Oh, I'm going to tell Michael Father all about it. Mike assured him. I'll tell him just as soon as I learn to play it a little more. Well, let's hear it, said Jake. Mike turned the harmonica over in his hand. Look around and see if it's all right, Joey. Joey sprang to his feet, glanced around with a whirling motion, and flopped down in the grass. Nobody but the sheep, he reported. Mike put the harmonica to his lips. Paul spoke up. Why do you close your eyes? Doesn't it work without closing them? Jake said, 
If he wants to close his eyes, freckle face, let him. Just be quiet. Yes, urged Joey, tossing a handful of grass jubilantly into the air. Make believe it's church time. Softly, Mike drew from the harmonica the marching melody of the great song. He had thrilled when he played it to himself. Now he was filled to overpowering with the melody. Behind his closed lids he saw scenes that moved and changed and stirred at the sound of the music. He was in a beautiful meadow. He wandered among big wheels turning. He heard angels singing. It must be angels that played the harmonica, for the three lines were ended, and still the music did not stop. The fourth and fifth lines of the great song came out of the harmonica. He believed he could have played on and on had he just been used to the wonder of it. The music painted the words for him and its beautiful melody against the sun-red curtain of his closed eyes, the words unfolded. Let us tell you how our brethren were beaten, and how no one would offer them refuge, how emperors, priests, and reformers despised them, hunted and killed them mercilessly without pity. He stopped and opened astonished eyes. His listeners sat as quiet and motionless as bundles tossed into the grass. The restless, reassuring tinkle of the sheep bells drifted over him as a gentle echo, and he held out the harmonica to Paul Weiss. Paul took it tenderly. Jake's voice faltered. I've never heard anything so pretty in my life. It's nicer even than the wild bird we had in the cage. The wild bird didn't sing at all in the cage, Mike recalled, as if he had been thinking of the same thing. No, but before it did. It sang before we ever caught it. The harmonica sings if it is in a cage or not, Mike explained. It is even better than a bird. Paul put the harmonica between his teeth, puffed out his cheeks and blew. Joey said, all you get out of it is spit. Paul had to agree. It spits if I close my eyes or not. Can you do it with your eyes open, Mike? I can, but it sounds better when they're closed. It is mu much music from such a little thing. Paul observed. It isn't any bigger than a curry comb. Joey said, how could you get it in your mouth if it was bigger? It's the mouth that plays it. It's not the mouth at all, Jake said thoughtfully. Paul's mouth is as big as Mike's, and you see how he drips. It's not the mouth only, it's something you must have inside. This is something you must have in the head. Paul blew a loud, discordant blast, and Mike silenced him. Do you want the whole colony to hear you? Jake took the harmonica. Nobody blows it except Mike. Listen to the householder, Paul laughed. Have you taken this up with the elders, Mr. Householder? Jake's dark eyes were serious. I wouldn't even tell the elders about this. You mean really not to tell them? Mike asked with a catch in his voice. Jake held the instrument between both hands. You mean never to tell them, Jake. Joey's eyes danced in expectation and wonder. You mean it to be a secret, Paul asked hesitantly. The group sat half hopefully, half fearfully. Then Jake, assuming the voice and manners of the householder, twisted a finger in a make-believe beard. As householder, I appoint you, Newman Mike, harmonica boss. Joey Cunns rolled laughing in the grass. Paul slapped his knees excitedly at the impersonation. Mike said, Yes, Jake, but that needs the endorsement of the seven elders. Well, well, replied Jake in the same voice. 
comes Joseph, will you stop rolling long enough to tell me if you are in favor? Joey sprang to his feet and proclaimed, I am in favor, householder. I am for making Newman Mike harmonica and Sager. Come, come, said Jake. Do you want him to lead the singing with the harmonica? Isn't that going too far? Elder Weiss Paul, what do you think? We need more elders, Paul shouted. I'll run down and get some more boys. Mike sprang up and held him back. Wait, Paul. I am tired of being scared, whether you are or not. We can get Dan Mueller and your cousin Matt. Scared of what, Mike? Jake asked. I don't know. I have been scared ever since I took the harmonica. If Joshua Volkner had given it to everybody, that would be different. But he gave it to me. He said it was mine. That makes it like something in the world, where people own things personal. That isn't all. Has there ever been a musical instrument in the colony? Instruments are, are of the devil. James the teacher told us that many times. That makes me scared too. I just wanted to play it a little because it is so pretty, but I don't want to play it much and not at all in secret. To have a secret is as bad as having a possession. Tonight I'll tell Michael father and tomorrow whatever he says I'll do. Jake plucked at the grass. You had the harmonica only a few days, he marveled, and already you can play the great song. That comes easy. All right, it is more than Paul or Joey or I could do. I think, Mike, you were supposed to have the harmonica, and you were supposed to play it, or else God would never have let Joshua Volkner give it to you in the first place. Mike devoured him with a glance. You think so, Jake. You really think so. God sees everything, doesn't he? God even makes you blow on the harmonica the right way. I'm older than all of you. I am eleven, but I would just like to stay here in the grass and listen to you make music all my life. That would be enough for me. With this pronouncement, Jake stretched himself full length on the sheep hill, locked his hands behind his head, and gazed up at the sky. Mike looked down at him. He saw how Jake always had to lie with his head slightly to the side because of the lump on his neck. He figured that anyone who carried such a cross as Jake did ought to know something about God's ways and God's plans. The harmonica had never felt so completely right as it did now. Jake's words were true. If God did not want him to have the instrument, he would never have given it to him, and he would certainly not have put it into his heart to play the way he did. If it were something bad, it would be different. If it were painting pictures, it would be breaking the commandment about graven images. If it were making a sling to throw pebbles, it would be wrong because it might kill something. But to make sweet music, Jake was right. To lie in the grass and hear the harmonica was all a person should ever want. Suddenly, Joey Kunz leaped into the air. If Mike makes the music, I can make the wheel. What wheel? asked Paul. The big wheel. It won't be five stories high, but it will go round. Didn't I make this old pail turn on the stick? Look, here in the open end, I forced in a board and cut a hole in for the axle. I cut a hole in the pail bottom, too. When I pull the pail, it turns, and the stones inside give it a good rattly sound. I'll build the big wheel, and it will have seats, if not for people, then for something just as good. Then let's get the elders quick, Paul exclaimed. Let's get them quicker than it takes to ride the truck. Joey agreed, and with the long stick between his legs, he and Paul started down the sheep hill. 
Paul, Joey, come back. Mike's cry was lost in the rattle of stones, in the tin pail, and the sound of bare feet running, scattering the sheep, thumped an accompaniment. Jake, what will they do? Jake lay as before, only that he had closed his eyes. Jacob father told me once I had no music in me. He confided quietly. He said it must be because of the bump on my neck. Do you think if I didn't have the bump, I would have music? Does the bump hurt much? Mike asked. It hurts sometimes. It's a cross, like Sarah Kunz's rheumatism. Jake nodded sadly. Why does God give anybody a cross, Jake? Why does he let weeds grow, or why does he let flies come, or let the rust get on the wheat? I don't know. Jacob Father says it is to make us work and keep us humble. Pretty things would make me work, not crosses. Since I have the harmonica, I would do anything no matter how hard it is. I have even been thinking I would build up the wood pile for the kitchen boss. That will have to do anyhow when the wood boss tells us. It's the feeling I meant, Jake. Since I have the harmonica, it is just as if I had wings. Play the song again, Mike, just for us. I should see if the sheep are all up right. The sheep are all right. Play the song. Mike played, and when the inspiration of the music carried him almost halfway through the great song, Jake said, You played better than any boy in the whole world, no matter how big the world is. Joshua Volkner's boy has one too, Mike remembered, but can he play it? I don't know, but if he comes here, as maybe he will come for Rachel's wedding. Jake shook his head. No, we want nothing to do with him. Everything that Joshua Volkner does is wrong. All the men say that, but one thing that wasn't wrong was to leave pretty music with us. As for the way his boy plays the harmonica, you could beat him even with your eyes open. A strong voice broke over them. There's a black sheep down at the potato patch, and the whites are with him. Paul Weiss, the sheep boss, stood above them, hat pulled low over his eyes, his thick lips set in his short-cropped beard. Get up, Jake Lender, go back where you belong. When two of you boys get together, nothing is done. Jake and Mike stood accused before him, but Mike succeeded in slipping the harmonica into his pocket. The stern, green eyes of the elder saw the motion, but for some reason he said nothing. He did not seem anxious to con condescend to any further talk with the boys, who had done their work badly. Go on home, he ordered. Better the sheep watch you than you them. He started down the hill toward the potato patch his short, stout body moving through the grass, with arms swinging. Elder Weiss, Mike called. Your Paul wanted you for something. I know, I know, Weiss called back. I got the message. There is a meeting of elders tonight. Jake, do you hear? A meeting of the elders. Jake shrugged. They have many meetings. They started down the hill. Do you think it could, could be about the harmonica, Jake? Nobody knows about that. Nobody unless Joey or Paul. They just heard about it. The meeting was called early. Or unless God told it to somebody. Mike whispered. Could that happen, do you think? Jake asked. Troubled at Jake's tone, Mike felt his fears deepen. Sure, that could happen. Sure it could. And he broke into a run. I am going to tell Michael Father right away. I must tell him everything. Wait, Mike, wait. But Mike was speeding toward the path that led to the commune and to the cabinet shop. 
The cluster of buildings rushed to meet him. The big barn and the shops were on him before he realized it, but he did not stop. Guilt ran with him, and he was saying half aloud, I know it was wrong, Michael Father. I know now what you mean by owning things personal like people do in the world. I am ready to give it up and confess everything. But another voice within him said, Think how pretty it was. Jake lay in the grass, and it made him feel good all over. Think of all you see with your closed eyes. Think of the good taste. Pretty music it is. Mike likes God's music. Where does it come from if not from him? Who showed you how to play it unless he did? Wait, Mike, wait. He was walking now slowly. He was near the house of the town man, which stood close to the river bank. He could catch a glimpse of the cabinet shop through the openings between the houses. Abruptly, he found himself turning into the long, narrow path that ran to the river flat. This trail led past the mill, into the meadow, and through the wheat field. If he wished to pursue it that far, he did not know how far he would go. Here, where he walked, the river flowed. The river, with its incessant humming sound, understood. It did not stop to ask what he was doing, or where he was going, or whether the harmonica in his pocket had a right to be there. The river just went on out into the world, singing. How free it was! How wonderfully free! Here was the spot where Jake and he had once made a sailing raft. The fathers said it was best to destroy it, because it might float them out of the commune grounds. Farther on was the balanced rock, a flat stone the height of a man, leaning out over the water. Here was the gravel pile, thick with flat, round stones for skipping. The river never complained about the skipping stones. It swallowed them up with a gulp, and kept right on its way. It turned the mill, the mill wheel, and stirred up the foam, as white as the lather on Joshua Volkner's face. The water laughed and played to its heart's content under the mill wheel. When the mill boss pulled the big lever and all the machinery was quiet, the water was quiet too and went on in its way. Nothing in the commune was quite so free as the river, and just now it seemed to little Mike that there was some connection between the Missouri and God. Hopefully he raised pleading eyes to the sky. Anxiously he hoped for some special sign that would make the whole of life a little less mysterious. The river did not even bother to ask for anything like that. It did its work, and it was free, and God seemed always to guard it, though it flowed a thousand miles up and a thousand miles down into the sinful world.